So if you recall last week we started a uh, series that I'm going to be working through called Distinctive Doctrines and I introduced that series last week and basically just made the point that it's important that uh, uh, great truths be repeated. That we need to be reminded of some of the more basic things about our faith, not just for those of us that have been here um, to be reminded of these things, uh, but also because there's always new people coming through. There's always people that maybe don't know these things, that have never heard you know, the Bible acronym uh, that, that we're going to be going through. And there's also, you know, not just those doctrines, but I also mentioned there were some other ones that are make uh, that make us distinct as those that would be identified as, as a new IFB uh, church, uh, people that uh, preach uh, specific doctrines, that there's even some doctrines that would make us more distinct from our old IFB brethren. And not, again, not because we're preaching something new, but simply that they have drawn back or moved away from some of these things and left us standing there uh, you know, holding the bag, not, not in a disparaging way. I mean, we're glad to hold these truths. We're glad to toe that line because it's biblical. And one of the first uh, doctrines I want to look at as we work our way through this series is the doctrine of biblical authority. And what that means is that the Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Everything we do, everything we teach, everything we preach should find its roots in the Bible. Everything that we believe should be found in the Bible. It should be able to be proven from Scripture. And if there's something we don't, if there's something we believe that is contrary to Scripture or goes against the Bible, we should be willing to change that. Right. And that's what we mean by biblical authority. That this book, the the Holy uh, King James Bible, is the the final uh, say so in, in everything that we believe and do as people and as a church. That we should always uh, look to the Scripture and allow it to establish us in what we believe. And really you say, well, I don't, I don't understand why you have to make the Bible the authority. But here's the thing. Everybody in life has an authority. I don't care who you are. Uh, even the, the heathen out there. They have something that they're going to say, well, I believe this is true because X, Y, and Z. You know, even the unsaved professor out there or, or whoever it is, you know, is going to say, I believe that, uh, you know, that the, I, did, I don't believe the Bible because I have certain authorities that I appeal to. And they hold those authorities in esteem and say, well, that's why I believe what I believe. Because somebody, uh, everybody is holding somebody as their authority. And the only difference between us and them is that we believe this book. And we say that this is our authority. Not the book man. of just a uh, word of some man, but also actually the word of God. Right. That's why we believe the Bible is our authority. So we live in a, in a, in a culture today, in a world today, that promotes this idea of not having an authority, of just being, you know, being a free thinker, being your own man, going your own way, you know. But here's the thing: nobody is really going their own way. Everybody's being influenced by somebody. Everybody is taking their ideas from somewhere and applying them to their lives. Everybody has an authority. Nobody's coming up with anything unique on their own. Amen. So we have decided, as Christians, as Baptists, that we're going to allow this book to be our authority. And that there's nothing wrong with that. Um, <clears throat> in fact, that's a great thing to have as your authority. The Bible is, is, a, is a very special thing. It's a very uh, a unique thing. And it's a wonderful thing that we have. Amen. The Bible says in Psalms 130, 138, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Uh, David there is saying, praying and saying to the Lord that he will... Mag that he will uh, he will praise him for his loving kindness. Why? Because he has because thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. The scripture declares that God has magnified His own word above His own name. Amen. And that's how uh, wonderful a thing that we have in the scripture. How unique of a thing. How authoritative it is uh, to us as the people of God that we have this book that uh, that <coughs> is, is uh, even exalted above the very name names of God Himself. And that's not a blasphemous thing to say at all. That's what the Bible declares. It's what God wrote in his book to say that, hey, I've magnified my word above all my name. <clears throat> so the thing is, we have an authority, but we have a very good authority. You know, we have a great authority to look to, and uh, we're going to talk about this morning about why we believe the Bible and why we make it our authority. Well, number one, because God has exalted it. God has lifted up his word. And <clears throat> the fact that we're going to have to choose somebody as our authority as I was alluding to earlier, you know, everybody is going to accept an authority. And they're going to do it by faith. You know, and, and, and I'm just going to come right out of the gate and say this, that that's what we do with the Bible. Why, why do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? Because it says it is. Amen. 
And you say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, I'm not trying to make sense. I'm not trying to allude to your uh, humanistic reasoning. It's something that's done by faith. It's something that I've experienced. It's something that right. I know in my heart. It's something that I've felt. It's something that uh, has been proven to me through it, uh, through applying these principles in my life and, and the power that's in the book. <clears throat> and, you know, everyone accepts their authority by faith. You know, as I was talking about the announcements, there I'm up there at the meteor crater, and they're talking about the millions of years and the billions of years and the trillions of years of space and, and uh, everything else that's taken place. And, were they there? Did, I mean, how did they know? Right. If they, oh, they're just trusting in some professor somewhere. Right. They're, somebody dug up some bones and, and made up a fairy tale, and that's their, what they believe. That's their authority. Uh, right. Authority. So, you know, I, I believe a little. I just have a different authority to them, but we're both accepting it by faith. You know, the one who believes in the Big Bang, they can't prove that any more than I can prove to you that this is the Word of God. Amen. But I have more evidence, you know, anecdotal evidence, I believe, to believe this is the Word of God than they have to believe in some made-up evolutionary fairy tale. Yeah. <clears throat> and here's the thing, you're there in Hebrews 11, look at verse 6. The Bible says, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. So when we come to the Bible and we say, I'm going to make this my authority, we, we say it not because I have all this evidence as why I should believe it. But we come to it and believe it and make it our authority by faith. And that's the way God's designed it. God wants us to act on faith. God wants us to accept His Word by faith. And without faith, the Bible says it is impossible to please Him. Yeah. That, that, that is something that is necessary if we're going to live a life that is pleasing to God. It's going to take faith for you this morning to, put, uh, to make the Bible your authority and to allow God to work in your life. Uh, the Bible says in John 8.47, you go ahead and turn over to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. We'll say, well, how, how, do you, how, do you, how can you just say the Bible is your authority and just, just do that by faith? How can you just say that by faith you accept the Bible uh, to be what it is, to be what it claims uh, that it is, the Word of God? Because, because of the fact that when I read it, it speaks to me. Because when I hear it preach, it speaks to me. Because when I do the things that I'm instructed to do in my life, I can see my life being made better by it. Right. I can see the Word of God working. Uh, you know, we see this so often out soul winning. When somebody gets saved, and, and we open up the Word of God, and we start to preach to them, and, and, and you watch somebody start to understand, you can almost see the, the Holy Spirit ministering to their heart. Right. And people believe it by faith all the time, and, and accept it. Uh, there's just something about it. And what it what what it is about it is the fact that it is the word of God. Amen. That's what has it, that's where its power comes from. It says there in uh, I'll read for you from John eight. It says, He that is uh, of God heareth God's word. Ye therefore hear them not, uh, because ye are not of God. You know, the unsaved person looks at it and says, Well, the Bible doesn't speak to me. And you know, there was a time in my life where I tried to read the Bible. I tried to read the book of John. I was unsaved. Yep. I got maybe to the third third chapter. I said, "This doesn't make any sense." Right. And it's not you know it's not a very complicated story. The first two chapters of, of of John, it's very easy to understand. But it just didn't speak to me. I didn't see well, why would anybody sit around and read about a guy in camel's hair uh, shouting out in the wilderness and you know eating eating bugs. Right. It didn't make any sense to me. But after having gotten saved, after coming to God by faith and being filled with the Holy Spirit, having the Holy Spirit indwelling me. Now I go and read that story, and I'm moved. Amen. I'm moved that there was a man named John the Baptist who went in the wilderness and and and, and, and was prepared under the coming of Christ and and uh, you know preached repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right. I, I'm, I'm impressed by that. I'm moved by that. Why? Because I heareth God's words. Why? Because I am of God. Amen. And that's the way it is for every child of God. If we have the Holy Spirit, if we're born again, we're going to read this book and we're going to and we're going to know that it is God's Word because it's going to witness to us. His Spirit will bear witness with our spirit. <clears throat> now you're there in Psalm 119, look at verse 165. It says, Great peace have they, Psalm, uh, 119, verse 165, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You know, when we, when we come to the Word of God and we love it, we accept it, and we say, this is my authority, the Bible says we have great peace. You know, I say... I, uh, that the Word of God is my authority, that it's, it's, uh, I believe it is the very written Word of God, and I don't, I'm not ashamed of that, and I don't lose any sleep about that. Man. And I don't lose any sleep about anybody that would say, oh, you're just, you're just acting on blind faith. You don't have any concrete physical evidence. You don't have any proof. 
that the Bible is the Word of God. How can you prove it? I don't lose any sleep over that. Over the mockers and, and the scoffers and those that would ridicule that position that I believe the Bible is the Word of God that I've made in my authority in my life that I'm going to do what it says. I have great peace, in fact, because I love this book. Because of, of the things that it teaches me and the things that I'm able to, uh, to uh, the way I'm able to live my life uh, because of it. I have great peace. And they say, well, you don't have any evidence. Well, what about the resurrection of Christ? I mean, just think about it. If you want, if you wanted to try to give somebody some kind of proof that this is the Word of God, I mean, think about, and I've talked about this recently, all the stupid things people write down. All the, just, just the volumes of literature that are out there that are just made up. Or things that have taken place. All the history that we have recorded of just wars and, and conquering and and just, just all the different tales of, of conquest and, and adventure, just things that actually happened, that are written down, that people took the time and say, hey, we need to write this down, this is important. I mean, if there was a man that came to earth and did the things that Jesus Christ did, and then died and was buried and rose again, don't you think somebody would take the time to write that down? Of course they would. Is that really so far-fetched that somebody would actually record the things that, that took place, if those things actually took place? Right. Again, I can't prove it to you. It's anecdotal. I can't prove to you that that's what happened, but I come to it by faith. And you know what it gives me? It gives me great peace. Amen. Because I love that law. <clears throat> you see, when we accept the biblical authority as Baptists, and what we mean by that is that we believe that yes, the Bible is our authority in all matters of faith and practice, but why? The reason why is because we believe that the Bible is inspired by, by God. We believe it is inerrant. And we believe that it is the preserved Word of God in the King James Version. Right. That's why we accept it as authority, because it's inspired, it's inerrant, and it's preserved unto us. <clears throat> and that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Why is it that we accept the biblical authority? Well, first of all, we accept it because of the fact that the Word of God is inspired. We believe that. And again, everything I'm going to tell you this morning is going to, is going to come from the Word of God. So I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm proving my authority by my authority. And people can mock and ridicule that all they want, but I'm coming to it by faith, right. as the Bible, as, as we're instructed to do. If you would turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3. We believe this morning that the Bible should be our authority because of the fact that the Word of God is inspired. It's inspired by God. <clears throat> the men that wrote the book, uh, they were moved by the Holy Ghost, as we'll read here in a minute. Yes, the Bible was physically penned down by man. But they were, those men were, were inspired by God to write the things that they wrote. Yeah. Not only think by the things which they had seen and heard, but also by the, the very moving of the Holy Spirit in their heart. Bringing into remembrance those things which they had seen and heard, that they might reiterate them. And the Bible just fits together like a, I mean, a book that was just written over thousands and thousands of years. Men that were just separated by generations foretelling things. And then men recording those things coming uh, to pass. I mean, there's some proof for you. They can say, well, it's just one. Either the Bible is the Word of God or it's the greatest hoax that man has ever played. And it's the most elaborate, deep, longest running conspiracy that it's ever been. And I don't, you know, and, and quite frankly, it's probably near impossible right. to pull that off. And I know 9 11 was impressive. Right? I mean, that, they really got the wool over a lot of people's eyes on that one. Right. But this, this, is, this is monumental. In scope, if it were just some big, vast conspiracy, I mean, it would be impossible to pull it out. I mean, when we read about things that that are being prophesied about the death of Christ, down to the details yep. about how he would die, about the things that he would say, and then them saying he said it, he did it. That's exactly how it happened, as it was predicted thousands of years earlier. So we believe the Bible is the word of God because it is inspired. You know, the Bible was penned through man, but it was penned by God through man. You know, you kind of, kind of try to explain this to kids sometimes. It would almost be like if you sat down and somebody else just put their hand over yours and kind of told you what to write. I'm not saying that God took over them and just made them into a robot, but he moved through their hearts to, to write the things that they wrote. It says there, and, you know, and that's what the Bible clearly de uh, declares there. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction of righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So it says there that all Scripture is given by what? By inspiration of God. That's why we believe that the Bible is given to us by inspiration because of the fact that it says it is. 
And I'd like to point out one there in that verse that says, all, okay? All Scripture is given by God. Meaning this, that all Scripture is authoritative. And we've got a lot of, even Baptists today, that want to look at certain passages in the Old Testament and say, well, you know, that doesn't apply anymore. Or, you know, that 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 doesn't that was just shouldn't be there. You even have people today are saying that well, that whole passages that shouldn't even be in the book, saying, oh, you know, those those verses shouldn't even exist. That that, that was wrong for them written that written that down. This is misinterpreted, and uh, they they want to cast out certain passages. They want to disregard certain passages. But the Bible says right there that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Even the parts that we don't like right. are still authoritative. Even the parts that are gonna you know, rub, uh, rub the fur the wrong way and are going to chap our hide. They're still given by the inspiration of God. And we're either going to make these things our authority or we're not. And if we do, the Bible says that it's profitable for doctrine and for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That we might, as the men of God, might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Go ahead and turn over to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. So we have to understand, first of all, that we believe the Bible, we take, accept the Bible as our authority because we believe the Bible was inspired. It was given us to us by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. If you're there in 2 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 20. Knowing this, first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the proph prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Of course, this is alluding to the prophets. I mean, the, the Spirit of the Lord would come upon these men and they would, they would, uh, they would preach and they would prophesy and they would, uh, they would say these things as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And those things that they were said were written down. They were recorded. And they were uh, preserved for us today. So we have these things because of the fact that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You know, it wasn't just some, you know, uh, just some, some weirdo, you know, some just some bozo getting up and just spouting off in the mouth. These were holy men of God that spake. These were men that that loved God. These were men that were uh, used by God as prophets, and, and God would they would speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. They weren't just making these things up as they went along. And it says there that it's not of any private interpretation. And the Bible isn't just something that. Uh, you know, we can take and make it to say whatever we want. There is a way the Bible has to be taught. There are things that are foundational and they have to be interpreted a certain way. You know, people can go to the Bible and they can they can make it say whatever they want. And they can go to certain passages and try to force it to, 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 to mean something that it doesn't. But that is a private interpretation. That's somebody saying, well, this is what I believe the Bible says. Well, it has to line up with the rest of Scripture. You have to compare spiritual things with spiritual things. You know, we don't have the liberty here to just teach whatever we want from the Word of God. That's what we mean by when we say the Bible is our authority. You know, I as a preacher just can't get up and say, well, I, I know the Bible says this, and it's commonly been taught that, it's, that the, the Bible means this, but you know what, I'm going to give you my own take on what, it, what that means. I'm going to give you my own take on repentance and tell you what I think it means. That it means you have to turn from all your sin and, and turn over a new leaf and, and live a good life. You know, it has to line up. That, you have to line up all your doctrine with the rest of the Word of God. Otherwise, you have a private interpretation. And the Bible says that it is not of any private interpretation. We don't have liberty with the Word of God to just say whatever we want with it. We have to make sure that it all lines up. You know, all of our doctrine, all the practices we do as a church, they have to find their source in the Bible to be considered legitimate. You know, well, why do we baptize by immersion? Because of the fact the Bible teaches baptism is by immersion. All right. Why do we baptize people after they get saved? Because the Bible teaches you baptize people after they get saved. All right. If they told me to do it some other way or at some other point in a person's life, that's how I do it. Because that, the Bible is my authority and I believe it's inspired. And I believe that's how we are to do things. Everything that we do and everything that we believe has to find its source here in the Word of God. And with that being said, you know that's why we have to be really careful about outside sources. People want to start going to, they don't want to study the book. They want to study books about the book. You know, they don't want to study the Bible. They want to pull some other book off the shelf to tell them what the Bible uh, means. The best way to study the Bible is by reading the Bible I and mean, picking up and letting it speak to you. You know, you have no need that any man teacheth you, but the anointing that you have teacheth you of all things. You know, the Spirit will guide you into all truth if you just pick up and read it. There's nothing in the Bible that you can't, as a believer with the, that has the Holy Ghost, that you can't pick this book up and learn on your own. 
it might take you a little bit longer, and that's why we, we're thankful for preachers right. who have also learned from other preachers. And then we're being, we're being taught things that have been passed down from generation from generation. The things that I'm going to teach and preach up here are things that I've been taught and heard preached myself. And the person that, that taught uh, me through their preaching learned from somebody else. And there's no new thing under the sun. We're not making this up. Well, everything that we believe has to come from this book. And anything that we're going to pull off the shelf, any outside source that we're going to read about the Bible or try to get doctrine from has to line up with this book. And, you know, if that were the, if that were the philosophy that a lot of people had, there would be a lot of books going in the garbage. Because there's a lot of outside sources today. You know, there's a lot of footnotes in a lot of people's Bibles today that are complete heresy. Yep. You know, the Schofield Bible. Yep. You know, if you, I, I highly recommend not reading that. Right. Yep. And there was a time when every Baptist in America had that. Where every Bible, you know, the Bible colleges were handing it out, saying you got to read it. And people have been indoctrinated with the lies that are in that book. You know, all these people that have the volumes of Peter Ruckman on their on their shelves should take them and throw them away. Yeah. And just start reading the book. And they probably might even need to get saved. They right. have a misunderstanding of that. And there's so many people that want to write books about the Bible. They want to write their encyclopedias and their concordances and their commentaries. And they and a lot of those things that they're writing are contrary to what we actually find in the scripture. And they need to be dismissed. Because again, my final authority is not some man's commentary. My final authority is not the teaching of some Bible college somewhere. My final authority is this book. And I don't care who it is. If they contrary to this book, they're wrong. And they need to get it right. right. It says there that the, it is of, uh, the prophecy uh, is of no private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. It wasn't the will of man that just decided to make the Bible. It was God who said, I want there to be a book. He's the one that decided that he was going to have his words written down and available for us so that we could know the very mind of God. You know, people are always saying, you know, I wish God would speak to me. You know, if God were right here, I'd believe him. Well, guess what? God's right here. And God's speaking to you Amen. through this book. Because God designed it that way. God, uh, you know, gave us this book, not by the will of man. That's not how we came to be in our possession today. It came because of the, the fact that it was inspired by God. Those prophets spake, and what they said was recorded and written down and preserved for us. The people say, well, I don't know if I can accept that. That sounds pretty far-fetched, that God would write a book. Well, if you don't think God can write a book, you must not have a very powerful God. Right. You must have a pretty small God. And, uh, you know, I remember when after I got gotten saved, I got a little mixed up in some false doctrine with this sacred name movement. They were trying to tell me that Jesus wasn't the right name, that it's this Yeshua Yahuwah, whatever it is now, I don't know, this was almost 20 years ago, that was probably a different pronunciation back then than it is today of the sacred name crowd. But it got me really mixed up, and it got me kind of doubting the word of God. I said, well, this is the Bible. I mean, how could that be? How could the name Jesus be wrong? You know, and they have all these big, long explanations of how the letter J exists back there. It's not very scholastic. It's not very educated right. kind of stuff. But it's the kind of stuff you run into when you spend a little too much time uh, you know, on the internet, you know, in the public library, so right. get your nose in the book, which was the problem that I had. So I got a little mixed up, and I remember it only went on for a little while, maybe a few weeks, and I just it got it brought me to the place where I had to say either, you know what, I got saved through this book, and either this is the word of God or it isn't. Either this book is, is the final authority or it isn't. Either Jesus is the name given um, among uh, um, uh, under heaven, given among men by which all men must be saved. Th either that is the name or it isn't. And if it isn't the name, then this book isn't right. right. And I can't trust this book. Right. You know, if I can't, if there's one thing wrong with this book, then I can't trust any of it. How can you trust any of it? If there's, if you think there's even one thing that's wrong with it. So I got, and I just brought me to the place of thinking, well, is it so far-fetched to think that God could write a book? And if God could write a book, clearly God has the ability to preserve a book. I mean, God can, you know, stretch the heavens out. Amen. You know, his, and His hand spans the universe. And we look at those skies and we can see the heavens and we see all those stars and God knows them all by name. Yep. Is it so far-fetched to think that God could write, put 66 books between two pieces of leather and have them put in your hands? Mm -hmm. No, not at all. That's very easy for God. <clears throat> it's just hard for man to accept that often. So... We believe, first of all, that the Bible is our authority because of the fact that it is inspired. And if it's inspired by God, that means this, that it is without error. It is inerrant. 
Now, we, I used to think, uh, you know, the word inerrant just meant that it's, doesn't, there's no errors in it. But that word inerrant is actually a little bit more specific. It means that it's incapable of being wrong. Not just that it is not wrong, but that actually it is impossible for something to be wrong. If I were to say, you know, I am inerrant, it would mean that it's impossible for me to be wrong. You know, ask my wife about that, and she'll tell you that I, in fact, am not inerrant, right? And neither is she. So <laughs> neither of any of you. Okay, so just clarify, right. right? But that that would be a very proud and, and boastful statement for me right. to say such a thing as a man. To say that I am impossible. To it's it's impossible for me to be wrong. But that's what we mean when we say that about the Word of God. When we say it is inerrant, not only is it not wrong, not only is it 100% correct, it's impossible for it to be wrong. Because remember who the author is. Holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Because God ultimately is the author of the Bible, it cannot have error in it. Amen. Amen. Because God doesn't make mistakes. Right. Now, sure, you can read the Bible and there could be printing, there could be typos, and I've seen them. And I've heard Scorby, you know, slip up here and there when I've listened to the Bible and audio. But that's man messing it up, right? And I say that man, that God, is, that the Bible is inerrant. There, it means there's not going to be anything in there that isn't true. There are no lies in this book. Everything that it says yeah. happened, happened. Yeah. Just the way it said it happened. <clears throat> so we believe the Bible is inspired. And we believe that the Bible is inerrant, being incapable of being wrong. And we believe that because of the fact of its source of authorship. Because it was God that was wrote it, that it was God that wrote it, it's impossible for this book to be wrong. Go ahead and turn over to uh, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, while you're turning there, I'm going to read you from Titus chapter 1. In Titus chapter 1, the Bible says, Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, in the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness and hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. The Bible says that God cannot lie. And we know that's true because who is, who, who is the father of lies? It's the devil. Yeah. And he's a liar, and, 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 and he, and he uh, you know, he's the father of lies. The so lying is not in God's nature. You know, God, it's incapable. Of God, God cannot lie. The Bible says. So and we, that means this: that everything that God wrote in this book, when we when we say we accept the fact that it is inspired, now we can say, okay, and since it's inspired by God, now I can accept the fact that it's perfect. Right. Because now I understand who its author is, and now that I understand who its author is, that I can now accept the fact that there's nothing wrong with this book, that there are no lies in it, that there are no errors in it. <clears throat> the Bible says in 2 Peter, I'll read to you, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So we see that the scripture, it claims to be inspired. Why? So that we can be thoroughly furnished, as we read earlier, that we can be thoroughly furnished. So if, if, if we're given, if we're told to, to accept the scripture, and, and that the, the scripture is given by inspiration for the purpose of making us profitable, uh, for doctrine, for proof, for being thoroughly furnished, that would mean that it has to be without error. I mean, if this book is what we're relying on to make us, uh, you know, uh, perfect in, in every way and make us whole, then it, it has to have everything that we need in it, and it has to be without error. And there's a lot of people out there they want to try and point out a lot of. They would say, well, there's these, there's errors in the Bible, there's contradictions in the Bible. They'll say. And say, well, you know, you, you Christians are so foolish to just believe the Bible will be the Word of God because it's it's just so filled with error. And, you know, we don't really have the time. It'd be maybe another interesting series or sermon, at least, to go through and try to and debunk those. And other preachers have done that. Uh, it's kind of outside the scope of this. You know, it's not the, the main point to try and debunk these errors. But you will run across people that will say there's errors in the Word of God. And to that, you know, we have to answer, well, a lot of a lot of the times, when you when you get down to it, you find out that they believe these things to be an error because of the fact that they're unsaved, because they don't understand the Bible. You know, it's like the people that are always trying to uh, say, "Oh, are, are you uh, are you wearing are you wearing a, a, a mixed garment? You know, is that cotton and nylon? You know, well, you shouldn't be doing that. 
You know, you're you know, you're not allowed to do that. The Bible says you shouldn't wear a mixed garment. But we're not allowed to wear, you know, linen and cloth together. You know, there's there's certain things that we can't. It's a specific mixture. It's not nylon and anything else. You know, it's not every every mixed fabric. And those things are done away in Christ anyway. Right. And and they but they don't understand that. They just turn to something and they say, oh, there, you know, there's a contradiction or there's something you're not doing. And but the thing is, we are we have this. We're thoroughly furnished on all good works because we have a book that's inspired that is inerrant. And we understand the word of God. And when you come across these people that want to point out some kind of a contradiction, what you'll find is that it's coming from a place of misunderstanding. It's somebody coming from a place of misunderstanding or a misapplication of Scripture. If you're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're going to look at uh, beginning there in verse 1, the Bible says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of, spirit, uh, of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. You know, the preaching for the, of the Word of God is for those that are perfect. Now, the word perfect there is not saying people without flaw, as we understand the word perfect mean today. He's saying people that are whole, people that are complete, people that are made complete in Christ, people that are saved. That's what it's talking about. Those that are perfect in Christ that have been made complete in Him. And that's who we speak wisdom among. You know, the things that we preach and teach uh, to, to God's people we don't care if the world understands it or not. We don't care if the world gets it or not. We don't care if they look at it and they can't. They scratch their heads and they say, well, I don't get it. I don't understand. Uh, how can that be? It doesn't bother us. Because we're speaking these words among them that are perfect. It goes on and says, Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God even in a mystery, even the hidden mystery, oh, hidden wisdom. So there are certain things in the Word of God that we're going to speak, the Bible says, that are a mystery. And that it's hidden wisdom. Now who's it hidden from? Who is it a mystery to? To the unsaved. <laughs> to those who would look at it and they can't understand it, they don't know why you would even believe it. To them it's a mystery. To them it's hidden. Which God ordained before, under the, uh, the world, under our, uh, before the world unto our glory. Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor neither have entered in the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. See, that's the key right there. That's why they don't get it. That's why the world can't understand it. That's why they say, oh, there's, mis there, there, there's contradictions, there's errors. Because they don't have the Spirit to discern the Word of God, to pick it up and to understand what it's saying and how to apply it correctly in their lives. <clears throat> And God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. It takes the Spirit of God to understand God. Yeah. It takes the Spirit of God to understand the book that God has written. That's what it goes on and says here in verse 12. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. You know, the, the Bible's available to everybody. Right. Anybody can go down to the dollar store and pick up a Bible today. People can walk into most churches and, and get a copy of the Bible. You know, the Bible's not hard to come by. It's freely given to us. But it's it's we're given the Spirit of God that we might know the things. It's one thing to just pick up the book. It's another thing to actually know what it means and to understand it. And that's why we have the Spirit of God. It takes the Spirit of God to know the Word of God. He says in verse 13, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but, by, uh, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The Bible is showing us that it takes the Spirit of God to understand this book. And that the reason the world looks at it and says there's errors, there's contradictions, the reason why they, they, they um, misapply it is because they don't have the Spirit of God. They don't have it. 
It's not there. They can't read the book. They can't understand it. They can't apply it correctly because there is no light in them. Right. They, 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 they read it as the Jews do. They have the veil over the space, uh, over their face that it remaineth unto this day. Just like when I was lost and I picked up trying to read the book of John, I was just like, why? Does it make any sense? Or try to go, go read through you know, Numbers, or Deuteronomy, or Leviticus. I said, what's the, what was the point of that? You know, as an unsaved man, when you have the Spirit of God, now you can go back and read those books. And you can say, well, I can see Christ here. And I can see the picture of Jesus. I can see the examples of faith. I can understand why God did the things that He did. And why is it? What's the difference? It's not that because I went to some school somewhere and somebody <laughs> taught me how to understand the Bible. It's because I got the Spirit of God. <clears throat> and that's what the Bible, and, that, and that's why the world doesn't understand it, because they have not the Spirit of God. So we believe the Bible is our authority because of the fact that it is inspired. We believe the Bible is our authority because of the fact that it is inerrant, that it is without error, and that it is incapable of error. And that's a really good principle for us when we read the Bible. When we come across something that doesn't make sense to us or it seems to contradict, you have to just come to God by faith and it be coming, if, as long as you're coming from the place of saying, I know the Bible's true, God said it, I believe it, that's good enough for me. You know, even if there's something difficult that I don't understand or seems to contradict something, I just have to say, well, you know what? I know the Bible's true. I know the Bible's inspired. I know who wrote it. I know that who wrote it is perfect. I know that he, that God wrote it and that he, is, he cannot lie and that he doesn't make any mistakes. So obviously the book is perfect. And I just keep reading. Amen. And you, you know what? When you come back across it again, maybe we'll have learned a little bit more and it'll make right. sense. Right. Or maybe you'll hear somebody preach something and say, oh, now I understand that. But don't ever come to it and say, oh, there's something that I don't understand. The Bible must not be true. You know, no child of God will ever come to that conclusion because they probably were never born again to begin with. No one's going to pick up this book and say, well, I only believe certain parts of it and, and claim to be a Christian. You know, you, you either believe, either you hear his words or you don't. Yep. And if you don't hear his words and if you don't believe them, you're not of God. That's, I mean, that's what what Jesus said perfectly clear in John. You know, you hear them not because ye are not of God. And if there's ever a time when we find ourselves reading the Bible and saying, "Well, I don't believe that," you know, you, you better really search your heart and see whether or not you, you're, you're in the faith. Right. And I don't believe any truly born again Christian is ever going to say that. Is ever going to come across some passage in the Bible? So, well, that's not true. Because you have to believe the Bible is the Word of God to even get saved. To understand that these things are written that you might believe. <clears throat> See, the Bible is inerrant. It does not need to be corrected. You know, that's why we have the King James Bible. That's why we'll always use the King James Bible. Amen. Because this book is preserved. It's inerrant, and it does not need to be altered. You know, why would God go through all the trouble of inspiring His Word, and then you know, and then uh, and then making sure that we understood it was perfect and inerrant, and then saying, "Yeah, but you know, we got to keep oh constantly revising it, and going over it, and correcting things and changing things." That's not an inerrant word. Right. right. That's a word that that constantly needs to be corrected. That's not a perfect word. We have the whole Word of God. We have the perfect Word of God, and we have it for us in. The King James Bible. And really, as amazing as all those things are, the fact that God would inspire people and that God would uh, give us a perfect Word of God, as amazing as those things are, what's really amazing is the fact that God gave us a, a preserved Word of God. Not only the inspired, but the fact that He actually preserved it. Now, I don't believe that, you know, that God inspired the exact English words that are in this book. But I believe that it is a perfect translation preserved to us from the original manuscripts. That's what I mean by that. Is that these English words mean the exact same thing as they do in the Greek or the Hebrew. Yep. You know, and that's why I don't need to go read, uh, 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 learn Greek and I don't need to go learn Hebrew to understand this book. Right. Because God wants me to know what it says, so it only makes sense that He would preserve for me an English copy. Yeah. You know, and, and again, you know, we don't have time to go into the whole scope of how you receive the King James Bible. I mean, that's that's a long subject, you know, that we, you know, to summarize it probably wouldn't do it justice. But there's a film over there called uh, New World Order Bible Versions, and if it's something you're interested in, you know, all those things over there on the shelf are free. You know, take them as many as you'd like and watch them and you know, watch New World Order New World Order Bible Versions. It's kind of a mouthful. 
and you'll 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 kind of understand a little bit more about why we believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. That's right. And the reason why we believe that is because the Word of God is preserved for us today. If God can inspire His Word, if God can record it without error, then it's not much of a leap to say that He can preserve it unto all generations. And this is really the dearest of promises that we have in the Word of God. Because if we don't have a preserved and perfect Word of God, then our, our faith is built on, on, on nothing. Then we're building our faith on the shifting sands of, of man's wisdom. Of man just telling us, well, this part is the Word of God, this part isn't. And man changes all the time. And man it can, you know, ends up just being tossed to and fro. If you would, turn over to uh, Psalm... Uh, <clears throat> go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. <clears throat> the Bible says in Proverbs verse 30, every word of God is pure. Proverbs chapter 30 verse 5, it says that. And that was one of the first verses I ever memorized and it's when I was, when I was uh, first saved. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. You know, when we just say, hey, when we come to this and say, I believe this book is God's word by faith, it's my authority, you know what it becomes to you? It becomes a shield. Right. And it can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You have something to, to stand behind and to guard yourself with. It becomes a shield to you. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. I mean, what a great thing to have a book that when, when, when life is coming at us, we can go to and say, well, what does the Bible say about it? And we can receive clear answers about what we ought to do and what we ought not to do. It becomes a shield unto us. He goes on and says, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. And there's a lot of people today that are trying to add to and take away the things that are written in this book. And, and they're wicked people. And they're going to be damned for it. Their, part, their, life, the, the, their names will be taken out of the, of the book of life, the Bible says. So, <clears throat> the Bible is preserved for us today. And uh, Jesus said that there, and, and I'll read to you from Matthew 24. He said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Well, you know, maybe the Bible does have some errors. Or maybe there's some things in there that were added. Or maybe there's some things that are missing. Right? That's another one you hear today. But what about the Gospel of Thomas? What about Enoch? You know, what about the Apocrypha? we got we got to add these other books. You know, these things got lost. These things have been hidden somewhere, and, and we're just coming across them. Well, then you just, you know, you just called Jesus a liar. And he said, you know, uh, his words shall not pass away. He said, you know, heaven and earth should, uh, should pass away, but, you, you know, not one jot or one tittle shall in any wise depart from the law. That we have the whole word of God this morning. Either we do or we don't. Either we have that promise from Jesus Christ or we don't. That every word of God is here for us. That everything we need pertaining to life and godliness is given to us in this book. It's preserved for us today. Amen. And it's really the dearest of all promises because every other promise in the book relies upon that. That, that everything we need is here or it isn't. You're there in Psalm 119, look at verse 89. The Bible says in Psalm 119, I should have just stated it earlier, Psalm 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. I love that verse. It's short, but it's got a lot in it. That verse says a lot, doesn't it? Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So when we come to the Bible and say, oh, I'm going to make the Bible my authority, I believe the Bible is my authority, you know, we, have to, we have to understand why it is that we make it our authority. Because it's inspired, because it's inerrant, and because it's preserved. And we have to ask ourselves, when we, you know, whose word is this? Is this just man's word? Is this just, is this just a, uh, a collection of, of stories? Or is it actually what it claims to be? The very word of God. And I believe that's what it is. That it is God's word. Whose word is it? Thy word is settled in heaven. O Lord, thy word. So that's what we believe about the Bible. That's why it's our authority, because we believe it is not just the words of men, but it is the very words of God. I'll read to you from 2 Peter. It says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. So people want to cast uh, doubt on the Word of God. Are, there, are they saying that the things that Jesus Christ, the coming of His majesty, was just made up? That it didn't really happen? Or that it was a misunderstanding? <clears throat> 
It says there that it's God's word. Thy word is settled in heaven. Where is it settled? It's settled in heaven. You know, where 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 the you know the, the translators of these modern versions they can't reach up there and change things up there. Right. Those words are settled in heaven forever. You know, I thought about that verse for a while, and I thought it was just really interesting that it's settled in heaven. You know, I think I believe that that God knew the things that were going to be written down before they were ever written down. That's right. That they were preserved in heaven. That He already knew uh, what was going to take place, and that this book was was already there and already in the mind of God before we ever had it in our hands. It's been settled forever in heaven. <clears throat> so, you know, really, of course, it can be kind of a, a bit of a dry topic to go over why we believe the Bible sometimes for some people. And it, uh, sometimes, even as a preacher, I'll be perfectly honest, it's hard to get excited about preaching a sermon like that. But we have to stop, when we stop and think about what it is that we have in our hands. Because we've all heard the sermons, and we, we've even preached the sermons. And there's a lot of other things we like to hear preached, and a lot of other things we want to preach. Because a lot of us already understand this and believe that, and we know that the Bible is what it is. But when we consider all this, when we consider the fact that it is inspired, that it is inerrant, and that it is preserved, we have to really stop and think about what it is we really have in our hands. And be put in remembrance of these things, that we have in our hands today a, a word that is settled in heaven. That we have a shield for our faith. That we have some, that, uh, uh, a shield from every uh, you know, snare and every fiery dart of the wicked. That we have the very word of God in our hands when we read it. <clears throat> so the challenge to this, of course, if we, want to, we always want to make application with these, with these sermons. Is, you know, I don't doubt that the, everybody in this room, I don't think anyone's going to come up to me after the sermon and go, well, I don't believe the Bible is the word of God. You know, if, if that's in your heart mind, please don't, you know, <laughs> or do so we can know where you're coming from. But I don't think anyone's going to go to and say, hey, Brother Corbin, you know, that whole part about the Bible being inspired, I don't believe that. <laughs> no one's going to come to me and say that. <clears throat> but here's the thing, we all believe that, but what are we doing with it? What are we doing with it? When we have the Word, we say, oh, I have the Word of God. Yep, there it is. Are we doing anything with it? Are we applying it to our lives? Are we living by its principles? Are we doing the things that it tells us to do? <clears throat> and you know, there's a lot there. There's a lot there that it's telling us. It's telling there's a lot of do's and don'ts in here, and we have to figure them out and, and understand what they say. And that's why it's important to be in church for the preaching of the Word of God. That's why it's important for us to be reading the Bible on our own and, and understanding what it says and applying these things to our lives. The Bible says, but be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Don't just be somebody who hears the Word of God. And says, oh, that's the word of God. I heard it. Yep, that he's right. Yep, well, that's what the Bible says. That's right. I believe that. Yeah, I got the inerrant. I've got the uh, preserved word of God there. For me, it's perfect in every way. God gave me this book. And then just set it on the shelf and not do anything with it. Read these words, understanding, knowing who wrote them and how, why we have them today. But then do something with them. Put them to practice in your life. Otherwise, they might as well just be words. It right. might as well just be another book that you collected over the years that you might have read a little bit once. You know, what, what, what's the difference at that point if you're not going to put it into practice? So we have an authority in our life in the Word of God. We have an inerrant, inspired, and preserved Word of God that is the authority in our life, or at least it should be. It's, author it's authoritative, make no mistake about it, but is it our authority? We'll know whether or not it is if we're doing the things which we hear from. Let's go ahead and pray. 